Bonjour à vous personnes Seine, je suis Renata Barcelos, la fondatrice Maigre Définitivement et la responsable de la méthode Maigre Définitivement en France. Et aujourd'hui, j'ai un invité et je suis tellement contente. Comme vous avez vu, je vais interviewer Gary Tobbs. Gary Tobbs est un acteur primé, de nombreuses fois comme le prix investigateur dans les recherches des politiques de santé, ainsi que les prix rapport international de santé pendant trois années de suite par l'association Écrivain Scientifique, et qui est une personne qui m'inspire énormément à faire mon travail. Gary a changé la façon de laquelle nous voyons la perte des poids en montrant comment les consignes qui nous étaient données étaient basées sur ce qu'il appelle « mauvaise science ». Et Gary est sans doute l'une des personnes les plus influentes dans le monde de la nutrition scientifique. Gary est l'écrivain des livres comme « Pourquoi on grossit »,« Good calories and bad calories » et mon préféré « The case against sugar » que je pense qu'il n'est pas encore disponible en français. Ce que j'apprécie le plus chez Gary, c'est qu'il ne veut pas seulement nous montrer ce qui ne va pas. Il ne veut pas seulement qu'on sache à quel point ce que nous savons à propos de la perte des poids est limité. Il veut améliorer les choses. Il veut que, dans le cas où nous avons besoin des directives alimentaires, qu'elles soient basées sur des preuves scientifiques solides. Gary est le co-créateur de l'organisation sans but lucrative appelée Nutrition Science Initiative, et son travail est basé sur la science et non pas sur des idées ou des intérêts. Gary est diplômé en physique appliquée par l'Université d'Harvard. Il a un master en ingénierie par l'Université de Stanford et un master en journalisme par l'Université de Columbia. Et il est ici avec nous aujourd'hui. Nous allons parler des principaux sujets de la perte des poids. Cette chaîne a été créée pour partager le plus possible des vérités scientifiques pour que vous puissiez être en bonne forme et changer votre vie basé sur le meilleur de la science. Donc, cette interview, elle va être en français, euh, en anglais, pardon, parce que Gary, il ne parle pas beaucoup français, malgré le fait qu'il ait quand même habité à Paris pendant deux ans, chose que je ne savais pas. Et euh, donc, nous allons passer en anglais maintenant. Vous allez trouver des sous-titres ici en bas. Tout est en français, OK? Hi, Gary. Hi. Thank Thanks you very for much for being. Oh, thank you for being here. It's such a pleasure to have you here with us today, and it's really an honor. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure. Okay, so shall we start straight with the first question? Yeah. Sure. Okay, Gary. Uh, I would like to know if you could tell us a little bit how did you start your journey into the scientific nutrition research. Okay, so uh, as you mentioned, or I think you mentioned with my 30-year-old French, um, I started, uh, I had a science background. I became a science journalist in the early 80s. I, I wrote two books in which I chronicled uh, the mistakes of physicists and chemists who discovered non-existent phenomena. So I was obsessed with how hard it is to do science right and how easy it is to get the wrong answer. And I had many friends and fans of the physics community, and in the early 90s, they suggested that if I was interested in bad science, I should look at some of the stuff in public health because they thought it was terrible. And so around 1993, 94, I moved into public health reporting, and it, it, the standards of the field did live down to everything that these physicists had said they did. They just, a lot of what, the harder scientists consider absolutely necessary to get the right answer in public health, it's too hard to do. And so they assumed it's a luxury and they don't have to do it. And just in the, well, 1998, 99, I just stumbled on the nutrition field. I actually needed a paycheck. And I asked my editor at the journal Science if he had an easy story that I could do. And this paper was coming out in the New England Journal of Medicine on a diet called the DASH diet, that's dietary approaches to stop hypertension, and it was a way of eating that reduced blood pressure significantly, but didn't include salt retention. So in reporting that story, I realized that there was an enormous vitriol, very vitriolic controversy about whether salt caused high blood pressure or not, and we'd been taught for 10 years already that we should eat low salt diets to avoid raising our blood pressure. So I turned over the story, I got my paycheck, I paid my rent, and I spent the next nine months interviewing 
around 85, 90 different researchers and government administrators about how we came to believe that salt caused high blood pressure. And it turned out the evidence behind it was terrible, which is why there was a controversy. And in the process of that, uh, one of the uh, scientists I interviewed multiple times took credit not just for getting us all to eat low salt diets, but for getting us to eat this low fat diet that we were all getting to eat in the 1990s. Actually, where I lived in Los Angeles, it was, you know, I treated fat like as bad as cigarettes or. Oh, okay. I don't know. So anyway, we uh, that that science also turned out to be pretty terrible. I spent a year on a single magazine article for science, and that kind of locked me in. I just kept going from there to see, you know, where this bad science led me. And from salt to fat, then it led to this idea of what what is it that causes obesity? Do we get fat just because we overeat? We take in too many calories, or is obesity a hormonal regulatory disorder? And if so, what is it about modern diets that triggers that hormonal disorder? And I ended up with my first book, Good Calories, Bad Calories, which argued that everything we had been taught for the past 40 years was wrong, and that maybe the French had eaten ideal diets to begin with, with their high fat, high saturated fat foods. And um, we got fat not because of how much we ate, but because of what we ate. And the problems were the carbohydrate content of the diet and the fat content. Yeah, we can see that we spoke about it on another day, uh, about how much um, the French people, they eat well, uh, right. despite the bread, of course, and the potatoes. And how everything is starting to change and how they want us to think that actually everything that they have been eating forever, it's bad. Uh, French people, uh, I got, it was a kind of shocked when I arrived here because they can eat every living thing ever. Like it's, it's so shocking for a Brazilian like me. So they have such a good, uh, way of eating. And this is changing because, uh, even now people still think that fat is bad. I always say that actually in US, you guys, you are ahead of us for at least five years. And we are still so stuck in that, in this common sense that fat will make you get fat. Fat will make you have a heart disease. Sorry? Yeah, it's interesting. A study just was published last week in uh, The Lancet, the British Medical Journal, ah, arguing that for, yeah, for the health, not just of the planet, but for all individuals, we should become vegetarians, maybe even vegans, that eating red meat is the, the worst thing you can do for yourself and eating animal products. And I think of you know, in the top five countries in the world in longevity are France and Switzerland, which have very high fat diets in which animal products are a, you know, a staple of the diet. Um, and <clears throat> here are these people who, what they do is they survey populations and then they tell you, they don't treat patients, they don't really care about traditional diets in any sense, but they think that if the people in France gave up their duck and their veal and their uh, eggs and their fatty sauces and instead ate, uh, you know, broccoli and legumes, that you would all be healthier. And the evidence to support that just isn't there. Yeah. And yet, this is the message we've been getting for 40 to 50 years now. And as we've been getting it, people have been getting fatter and fatter and more diabetic. And I think that's not so much directly because of eating more bread and more potatoes, but also because of consuming more sugar and drinking more sugar. France is about a century behind us in sugar consumption, behind the U.S. and the U.K. So as you catch up, your obesity and diabetes uh, prevalence will probably catch up as well would be tragic yeah and even we see as well the increase of the consumption of uh, junky food uh, things that they are called food that they yeah. are highly processed and it's really bad and you see that as much as this increases 
the population is getting fatter. The um, when you think about the processed foods and the proliferation of McDonald's in Europe and the world, uh, even then the question becomes: Is it all processed foods? So when you go into McDonald's, if you ordered the I forget what they call what what do they call quarter pounder with cheese and France. I don't even know. <laughs> There's a different uh, well, I know there was a different name for the egg McMuffin McGuff or something like that. All right, so but if you yeah, if you order the uh, the McGuff without the muffin and you don't eat the French fries, uh, or you order the quarter pounder with cheese and you don't eat the bun and you don't eat the French fries, you just eat the meat. And the cheese, the lettuce, and the tomato, and the special sauce. And if you don't drink the sugary soda with it, what would do you harm? And it may not be the most nutritious meal in the world, but from my perspective, and what's now, you know, what's constituted about 10 years of research that was at the time more research than any human being had ever done on this subject. Um, Again, it's not all processed foods, it's specific processed foods. And what characterizes those specific processed foods are the, the refined grains and the sugar content. Of course, yeah. Because actually eating without the bun, it actually really rocks in the keto community. Like people that they just don't have time, they grab a burger on McDonald's and they just take out the bun and they eat only the, bread, uh, the meat. So yeah, maybe yeah. it's not the so, most nutritious one, but at least there is no refined grains. That's actually the quite big problem in that. Well, and that's the thing. So even if you're, let's say the McDonald's meat is not up to the quality that we would prefer, then the next question I ask is, how much would it shorten your life if you ate the hamburger at McDonald's without the bun every day for lunch instead of, I don't know, uh, whatever your choice of healthy lunch might be. Um, and even if that meat is not as nutritious, we'd like it, but if you probably worked out the numbers, it might shorten your life on average by like a week. Um, it's one of the things nobody ever bothers to quantify when they say this food's healthy and that food's not. The question is how much longer are you gonna live and how much longer are you gonna be healthier if you eat that food instead of this food and when you actually work, when those numbers have been worked out in the past, it's trivial differences. And this is compared to if you eat a ketogenic diet and you go from being obese to lean, or maybe being a type two diabetic who gets off all their medications, where you're seeing a dramatic change in your health within weeks to months by getting rid of the, the refined grains and the starches and the sugars. Yeah, it's it's actually quite incredible the changes we can see uh, and how much you can change, how much you can improve your health once you take out the grains, the sugar. Uh, myself, I myself, I changed completely my life. I have always been overweight. I have PCOS. So since I'm 13, I think I start getting fatter and fatter and fatter. So I tried literally every diet, every single diet in the world. I have been followed by, by lots of health professionals and I actually could never lose weight uh, and not getting all back and even more. So when I started eating low carb, like I lost 20 kilos in four months, maybe, yeah, yeah maybe a bit more. So it was a dramatic change for me. And I'm keeping this weight ever since, and it's been already five years. So it's amazing how much you can improve your life and your health once you stop eating those kind of foods. Foods. Well, this is one of the issues that always, there's a lot of issues that um, irk me. One of the problems with being in my position in life is, so you do this research, you come to conclusions, you know, I think I'm good at what I do, just as the researchers and the administrators and the public health people think they're good. And so I want to believe I'm right. And if I'm right, it's hard to uh, understand when people disagree with you. But um, they talk about one of the, the issues with the way you eat is people say, the experts will say, well, it's not sustainable. Uh, nobody's going to be able to keep up eating a ketogenic diet. So a ketogenic diet is just a diet where you're eating the only 
carbohydrates you're really getting are from green vegetables and you're eating a lot of you know some protein and a lot of fat so basically it's not eating the bread and you're not eating the starches and you're not eating the or drinking the sugars and if it works so well for you as it does i mean the thing this is what happens to a lot of us we all we become a little bit we sound like zealots because you spend your whole life fighting what you think is an intractable disorder which is this you know excess weight the obesity you just seem to get fat no matter what you do, and you can stop it for a short period of time by uh, in exercising three hours a day or, or starving yourself. But then you think about food all the time, you're hungry all the time, eventually you, you go back to, to trying to satisfy your cravings and the weight just, it's called rebound weight. You just explode with yeah. fat. So then you find a way to eat that just removes these carbohydrates that and the fat seems to go away. It's as though you flick the switch. And then you sound like a zealot to anyone you describe it to. And they say, well, you could never sustain this way of eating. You say, well, of course I'll sustain it because I don't want the fat to come back. So I'm I now don't pretty confident. I not feel miserable anymore. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to feel miserable. So it's a, the, the discussion that goes on among the public health authorities and in the magazines in which they discourage people from trying this way of eating. And one of the things they tell you is, don't try it because you'll never stay with it. And what we say is, well, if you try it and you find out it works, why wouldn't you stay with it? I mean, yeah. yeah, it's true that you can't drink a lot of beer anymore and you have to avoid sweets, but I used to smoke cigarettes and cigarettes used to be sort of the driving force in my day like they are with all smokers. You, know, you wake up, you have a cigarette, you eat breakfast, you have a cigarette, you take a shower, you have a cigarette, you walk to work, you smoke while you walk to work. You know, you take cigarette breaks at work, you smoke after lunch or in between meals. Um, I couldn't imagine my life without smoking. And then I tried to quit every day for 20 years. And eventually I succeeded in the first three months, first three weeks were horrible. Um, I craved cigarettes every moment. And the first three months were terrible. And the first year was pretty bad. And I had to warn my friends that just apologize. Look, I'm going to alienate you because I'm going to overreact to everything that happens. And after about two years, I couldn't imagine having a cigarette. And after three years, I couldn't imagine that I ever smoked. And so... I, to say that I, I would not be able to sustain smoking because I would miss cigarettes too much, simply untrue. After a while, I just don't, you know, I, I couldn't imagine smoking. And people worry about not being able to eat sweets again or sweets defining their lives. And that we've made, as, as I said in my book, sweets become the way we reward ourselves. They become the way we communicate love to our children. You know, they... How we celebrate yeah. love and good achievements, yeah. yeah. Everything, every holiday, and certainly in the United States, is associated with some sweet treat. And then there are holidays that turn out are all about sweets, like Halloween. Um, and yet uh, you go a few weeks to a few months without them, you don't miss them that much. And you yeah. go a year or two without them, and you, you don't miss them at all. And often when we talk about low-carbohydrate diets, there are some people who think that the best way to do these diets is to allow yourself cheat days. So Friday night, I get to eat what I want. If I want a piece of pie, I get to have a pie. And that might work for some people. Um, for others like me, it feels like I'm managing an addiction. Like I'm allowing myself to smoke cigarettes only on Friday nights. And the rest of the week, I'm going to think about, can't wait till Friday when I get to smoke as opposed to I can't wait till Friday where I'm healthy like every other day of the week. I don't smoke because I'm not a smoker and I'll do something else that's enjoyable. So. Yeah, I don't suppose it works for everyone. Um, I agree with you on this one. Um, I've been there. I quit cigarettes as well and I know how hard it can be and how free you feel once you actually you passed after this addiction and you like you over it. And as you just said, sugar is the same. Like you, you'll be craving for a week or two or three maybe, 
or every time you are on a holiday on family and there is always the, the, the sugar there, the rewarding, maybe sometimes can be hard, but after a month or two, it's gone. And yeah. if, uh, if a low carbohydrate um, diet or even ketogenic diet that is even more low carb, if that is not sustainable, as they say, why they still actually say that DASH diet is good? Because you can do that for a long time either. So well, where is the logic there? Yeah, no, that's where it gets a little crazy. And I, I often wonder, am I just, I don't get it. Because in order to, so they, they, especially, I don't know about in France, in the US, we get this message all the time that, we should eat, well, a DASH diet is considered the healthiest diet. And this is, you know, mostly fruits, vegetables, whole grains, legumes. There's some meat, but it's lean. And there's dairy products, but they're lean. They're low-fat dairy products. Um, we're supposed to, we're told we're supposed to eat a Mediterranean diet where you get to use more olive oil, um, maybe a little more fish in the diet, or uh, just a vegetarian diet, it's a healthy dietary pattern. But if you want to lose weight on those diets, you have to consciously restrict how much you eat. Um, that's also accepted science. And as soon as you're consciously restricting how much you eat, you're going to be hungry. And we know you're going to be hungry. Um, and miserable. Almost, Don't forget miserable. <laughs> <laughs> miserable. Well, that's the thing. Often... Um, yeah, I remember, because I went through a similar uh, process as you did. I was more of an athlete, and I, I, I put on muscle easily, and I played American football in college. But after college, after football was over, where I weighed about 120 kilos, maybe, um, I then dedicated myself to, to losing weight, to getting back to a normal, a healthy weight. I was no longer had to be big for football. And from 21 years old onward, I was on some diet or another virtually all the time. And I was always exercising and it was always a struggle. And when I did try to really lose the weight on calorie restricted diets, and you, so you'd go to lunch and you'd order a scoop of chicken salad, which they would serve in a lettuce cup with some salad with low fat salad dressing and I would eat it and I'd be starving and I'd think about food all the time and then after lunch I'm basically waiting till the next small portion of food I could eat and uh, it's an entirely different phenomenon I now understand the, 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 the hormonal basis of this but it's an entirely different phenomenon when you go on these low carb diets first of all you could eat as much as you want that's the prescription so you, for somebody like me, I could go out to lunch and eat, you know, half a roast chicken with a huge salad with avocados and a nice, you know, olive oil all over it and butter on the chicken, and that's part of my diet. And it was almost a joke the first time I tried it because I would say to my friends, I would, we used to go to this. I lived in Los Angeles, and there was a chain of Argentine restaurants that young, not very well-off journalists could afford to eat at and poor screenwriters and my friends would go and they'd order the skinless chicken breast with the salad and i'd have an appetizer of melted mozzarella cheese with pepperoni in it and i joked that this was my health food because i'm experimenting with this diet and then i would have a 12 ounce steak fatty piece of meat with another green mm. salad and it was and you would lose weight and it's a bizarre phenomenon when you first experience it. Like I said, it's, a, and I understand it now. It's as though your body has flicked the switch, which it has. And now you're mobilizing fat from your fat tissue rather than storing it. You're burning it for energy. And um, it's nothing at all like how they describe it, how the experts talk about it. They talk about it as though it's such deprivation where you're not, yeah, okay, I didn't get to eat the French fries. And I didn't get to drink the Coke, but instead you get, you know, if I was in France, I would have half a roast duck for lunch. And uh, it's, it's, 
you eat just so well. Like I, I had a really hard time actually telling myself, you're eating healthy. That's how you're supposed to be eating. Like the butter, like you've been, I've been avoiding butter ever since I'm a kid because it's bad for me. It's going to be bad for my heart and I'm going to get even fatter. And then from a moment to another, I start eating fat and actually I'm losing fat. That was just yeah. really a magical moment for me. And Gary, yeah. like, but it's still the common sense is still tell us that the high fat uh, hypothesis is something that is going to actually cause a uh, heart disease. Health professionals included, they say that. And yeah, you are ahead of us, but we are still here. And I feel that in France, um, the health professionals, they still chain down to those myths. And uh, why do you think this kind of information is it still shared as being the truth, even knowing that actually we have evidence that show the opposite? Well, this is, uh, everybody interprets the evidence from their perspective. And uh, that's just human nature. So if your perspective is you're part of the health establishment, uh, everyone you believe and everyone you know in the, in the public health world believes the same thing you do. In fact, you know, the, the higher people are up in the, the nutritional hierarchy, the more firmly and zealously they believe this idea that dietary fat is bad for you and salt is bad for you. And then the people who get hired and the people who get promoted are the ones who believe this is what's called groupthink. And it's very powerful. So it's kind of like belonging to a church where everyone in the church believes the exact same thing. And, you know, if you start believing something else, you have to leave the church. So suddenly you become one of us and you interpret the evidence. And we, we have to talk about this concept of metabolic syndrome. But if you start thinking the way we do and you're from, everyone else in the church thinks the way they, they always thought, then you have to leave the church. Then you have to become one of us. And it's not easy to be a heretic. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not particularly fun. Some of us grew up as heretics, so we can accept the role easier than others. But um, it's hard to be the voice in the wilderness or the little boy saying the emperor has no clothes. These people don't get treated well. And I, I like the, the emperor has no clothes metaphor because it's like in real life, if this little boy starts screaming the emperor's naked, it's not like everybody goes, oh, yeah, he is. And they realize the emperor's naked and they, they dress him and the boy gets rewarded for pointing out that the emperor was an idiot. In real life, the little boy gets dragged away and put in some home and his parents get punished for, for not raising him correctly. And the little boy, you know, it's it's. People believe what they believed all along. That's just what we do. So let me tell, tell you about metabolic syndrome. Get away from sort of philosophy of science and thinking a little bit. Uh, and, as one, and, and there's a famous line about science. Uh, I think it was James Maxwell, the famous uh, electrochemist who said that science proceeds funeral by funeral. And the idea wasn't that people change their minds and they accept new ideas, but that old people who believe the, the old ideas slowly die off. <laughs> a generation of scientists come along who believe the new ideas. That may or may not happen here. Um, so one of the key revelations in my research when I was writing my first book was this concept of metabolic syndrome um, and insulin resistance. So you often see, I read this in, a, in an article this weekend about a young man, 38 year old man who had had a heart attack and he was writing this story as a correspondent for the television network NBC. And he was saying, he just had a line that said, you know, obesity and he's African American and uh, African Americans have high rates of obesity and high blood pressure. And these are triggers of heart disease as well. And they're, African Americans in general have elevated are susceptible to obesity and hypertension. So obesity and high blood pressure are part of this cluster of metabolic disorders that's known as metabolic syndrome. And they include uh, low HDL cholesterol, the good cholesterol, and 
um, high triglycerides, which are a form that fats uh, uh, travels in your bloodstream, and then uh, what's called glucose intolerance, which is kind of a pre-diabetic state. You have trouble controlling your blood sugar after a carbohydrate-rich meal. And it turns out that all these five diagnostic criteria of metabolic syndrome, so that's obesity, hypertension, low HDL, cholesterol, high triglycerides, and glucose intolerance, are all driven by the carbohydrate content of the diet and this hormone insulin. And this condition called insulin resistance. So that means you're resistant to the hormone insulin, which you secrete in response to the carbohydrates in your diet. When you're insulin resistant, you have to your pancreas has to pump out more insulin and to do the job of keeping your blood sugar low. And one of the things insulin does is it makes your fat cells store fat. So as you keep your blood sugar under control, you get fatter and fatter. Um, over the past 40 years, this metabolic, the public health community has realized that metabolic syndrome is the, more or less the primary cause of heart disease. You know, if you or I get a heart attack, it's not because going to be because we had ILDL cholesterol. It's going to be because we have trouble processing carbohydrates and we have insulin resistance and metabolic syndrome. And getting fatter, when you go to see the doctor, your doctor, the first criteria your doctor is supposed to look at to see if you have metabolic syndrome is whether or not you're getting fatter around the waist, which is an insulin problem. And if it's an insulin problem, it's a carbohydrate problem. So one of the revelations in my book was that when, when the heart disease research community went off to try and implicate cholesterol and saturated fat and heart disease, and I had written about this for science and spent a year investigating, and I found that there was no, the evidence supporting this idea that we shouldn't eat butter was terrible. And now what I learned instead was that there was this robust body of evidence implicating metabolic syndrome in heart disease and in diabetes. It's kind of a pre-diabetic state also. Type 2 diabetes, a common form that associates with obesity is insulin resistance. And all of this was tied to the carbs in the diet and all of it was tied specifically to the sugar in the diet. And that was the argument I was making the case against sugar. And metabolic, if, you're, if you have metabolic syndrome, if insulin resistance, if you're hypertensive and you're getting fatter, you're also at increased risk of cancer and you're at an increased risk of Alzheimer's disease. And this insulin resistance concept ties it all directly to the kind of carbs we're eating and the idea that some of us just can't tolerate those carbs and maybe we shouldn't eat them if we want to live a long and healthy life and not be miserable. And like I said, sugar because of the way sugar molecules metabolized in the liver is likely to be the cause of metabolic syndrome. And as I said before we went on the air, um, I found that a not for co-founded a not-for-profit in the course of doing all this research and writing my books and this not-for-profit funded research projects that what we thought asked the critical questions in nutrition because the nutrition community in general wasn't interested in asking them. So one of them was the relationship of sugar to a disorder called non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So it used to be that 20 years ago, if you had fatty liver disease and you told your doctor that you didn't drink alcohol, their doctor would assume you were lying. Fatty liver disease is pretty common in France. Um, and, uh, started showing up in children all the time and doctors started looking and they realized that there's this sort of epidemic of fatty liver disease in children who clearly aren't drinking alcohol and it associates with obesity and diabetes. So if you're getting fatter and you're glucose intolerant, then you're likely to have fatty liver disease. And so we funded a study where we took 40 kids, the researchers at the University of California, San Diego and at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia, took 20 children with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and gave them a sugar-free diet to eat and drink. In fact, no added sugars. They can still get sugar from fruit. But they didn't drink sugars and they didn't eat foods with sugar in them. And they compared them to another group of 20 kids. And the paper was published today in the Journal of the American Medical Association and written up in the New York Times. And here's a chronic disease that leads to 
critical liver diseases and eventually the need for probably a liver transplant, then all you have to do is take sugar out of the kids' diets and it goes away. Oh, effectively goes away. Suggesting that sugar is the cause of it. And so the argument I made in my book, The Case Against Sugar, is that you add sugar to any diet. Some diets are healthier than others to begin with, and, but you add sugar to an American diet or a French diet or a Swiss diet or a Japanese diet, and eventually you're going to get insulin resistance and then all these diseases that associate with it, which is obesity, diabetes, um, cancer, Alzheimer's. For how long was this study? Uh, this study was just eight weeks. Eight weeks. It was eight oh, right. weeks. It was a pilot study in that it wasn't as well controlled as we would have preferred. Um, cost around a hundred, excuse me, around one point five million dollars because it's All expensive right. to do these studies. But um, the message was, and again, it's you know, if you want to avoid fatty liver disease, fat accumulation in the liver, and fat accumulation in the liver is linked to insulin resistance. It may actually cause the insulin resistance we've been talking about. Um, and uh, the insulin resistance, like I said, is, the, is what type 2 diabetes is, and it's strongly linked to obesity, or maybe the cause of obesity, then not eating sugar is a good place, or drinking it is a good place to start. Yeah, because that's why I always say it's like you're not going to get sick if you eat yeah. lots of fruit. Like it's not the fruit the problem, it's all the rest, the beverages, oh. the sugar. Yeah, although I'm a little, I, I, I mean, I don't think fruit is as bad as fruit juice. But one of the things we embraced along the way, and this gets me in trouble just saying it, but the, the, the idea that the healthy diet includes a lot of fruit is not something that was ever tested. It's kind of put together by, uh, it just sounds right. I don't know why it sounds right, because eating fruit certainly didn't, do Adam and Eve any favors in the Bible. But um, the fruit, the berries um, are low in carbohydrates and low in sugar and probably benign. So one of the things I want to, when I have these kind of conversations, invariably somebody's watching it who's thin and runs marathons and thinks this guy's crazy. I eat, I eat fruit all the time. I'm a fruitarian. There are fruitarians who live on nothing but fruit, and I think they do it to prove that people like me are wrong. Nah, I'd probably egocentric. But anyway, the point is, some of us can tolerate the carbohydrates in our diet and burn them for energy, and some of us can't, and they make us insulin resistant, and they make us accumulate fat, and they make us diabetic, and they give us polycystic ovary syndrome. Um, you know, the lucky ones are the ones who can eat pasta and eat a lot of fruit, and the unlucky ones are the ones who can't. And we can eat, there are all kinds of other foods we can eat that are, you know, make for wonderful, satisfying. When I describe this meal to my um, friends in the States, I say, you know, this way of eating, it's just, it's eat the way the French did 50 years ago. To us, that's the Julia Child's era. But don't eat the bread and the potatoes skip the desserts. You know, not, some people can eat the bread and potatoes and be perfectly healthy, but some of us can't. If you're yeah. gaining, if you're getting fatter, if you've got metabolic syndrome, if your blood pressure is going up, then you're one of these people who's better off not eating. Or you can take pills. Yeah, I still prefer to skip the bread and the potatoes yeah. and not take the pills. Yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah, that's so... Actually, people, they think as well that I'm quite crazy when I say that if you're trying to lose weight, you should probably avoid eating fruits. And they always say, but fruits, they are healthy. And as a healthy thing, they think that when something is healthy, they can eat a lot of these healthy things. But like that just doesn't happen with fruits. But it's hard, it's hard to, to pass the message on this one. I'm glad that you're here helping me, backing me up. And again, it just depends on, I mean, if they're lean, 
Yeah, and exactly. Healthy, it then sure it's probably fine for them. But if you're not, then it's just it's another conduit for carbs and sugars. And you say, and what, even worse than that, you tend to eat it in between meals. So when you eat fruit in between meals, you're going to elevate. So the idea is insulin more or less orchestrates how you use the fuels you've eaten. So when you eat a mixed meal, the blood sugar gets to the carbohydrates are digested and go into your bloodstream and that raises your blood sugar. And you secrete insulin to burn off the, to, to keep the blood sugar under control. And it tells your fat to store fat. And as long as insulin's elevated, you're burning carbs for fuel. The diet book doctors would say you're a carb burner and you're storing fat. And what you want to do is, for those of us who store too much fat, you want to be mobilizing the fat, not storing it. And the way to do that is lower insulin. So if you have breakfast and your insulin goes up in response to the carbs and then it slowly comes down. And as it comes down, eventually your fat starts coming out of your fat tissue and you burn it for fuel. But as soon as you eat a piece of fruit, you secrete insulin, which actually secrete insulin just thinking about eating the fruit. And now you instantly go back to burning, becoming a carb burner and storing fat. So in between meals, you want to be liberating this fat and using it for energy, but instead you're eating a snack and keeping the fat stored. And then like a ratchet rinse, it just keeps getting a little more, a little more every day. Just 20 calories of fat stored every day is the equivalent of two pounds a year, which is 20 pounds in a decade. And it's the kind of weight we're all trying to lose by the time we're 30 or 35 years old. And that's just 20 calories a day. And that comes from this sort of process of the carbohydrates stimulating insulin secretion and keeping the fat locked away instead of allowing it to come out. Yeah, I want to yeah. add, by the way, that sorry, just a lot of the research I discussed in my first book, Good Calories, Bad Calories, a lot of my thinking was shaped by a French physiologist named Claude Lemagnon, who had uh, uh, Claude Bernard's office at Collège de France. And everyone agrees that Lemagnon was brilliant. And so basically what I'm doing is taking his thinking and that of a couple of other researchers and you just apply it to food. For whatever reason, Lamagnon didn't. He studied insulin dynamics and how they cause hunger and how they cause fat accumulation, but he didn't take the next step, which was to apply it to food so he could see if different foods had different effects on fat accumulation in humans. And so all I did in my books and other research I've done is taken that thinking and said, look, as soon as you apply it to food, it's pretty clear what's happening. And then you do the kind of experiments that you and I did, and you suddenly find out that if you don't eat those foods, you no longer you lose the fat. So. Yeah. And that's exactly what I was, I had a question that I was planning to ask, but it kind of got already answered. That was uh, why we get fat and what to do about it. But I think that we can, we, we are actually pr pretty clear since the beginning that is like avoiding those kind of foods. But if I would have to ask you again, uh, Gary, why we get fat? Would you answer me? Well, that's it. It's not because we eat too much or don't exercise enough. It's because of the types of foods we eat are creating a hormonal milieu that prompts our fat cells to accumulate fat calories. And that those foods that stimulate fat accumulation are the refined grains and sugars. And if you want to fix it, it's particularly then you pretty much have to remove all the carbohydrates. So the starchy vegetables, the potatoes and the legumes and beans and refined grains and sugars. And now you're eating green vegetables, cauliflower, dairy products, cheese, animal products, you know, sources of protein. It works. That's the crazy thing. It's always, people have always known it works. It's just the medical community it's so filled their heads with this misconceptions about the dangers of dietary fat and about this idea that fat people are just gluttons so they just eat too much and with those misconceptions they couldn't 
recognize the truth if it fell from the heavens and hit them in the head, which is what we've been trying to do with it. Yeah, but because actually what we got is associations. It's uh, observational studies showing that there is an association between one thing and another without considering all the other factors. As you were saying before, that actually it's a whole metabolic um, scenario, a situation that is going to lead to certain diseases. It's not something isolated. It's not only the fat. It's not only, it's many things together. It's not the salt that is going to make you have high blood uh, pressure. It's so many other things that all come together. And I think that understanding that it's actually the most powerful thing that you can do to yourself to understand how your body works and how even the um, losing weight works. It's it's such an interesting field. Okay, so I make you one more question. Do you think? Yes, right? we can okay. do one more question. Okay, so that's fine. Um, what should I ask you then? I'm happy to talk about calories briefly, but we've kind of covered it. Okay, we kind of covered it, yeah. Okay, so I'm going to make a tricky one for you. Okay. Um, much still has to change in the nutrition world. If you were in charge of creating a food guideline for a country, how would it be? Okay, uh, my food guideline would start with the recommendation to avoid sugar um, because of all the reasons we've discussed. I think sugar is the evil in this story. Um, and if you're, you know, overweight or uh, moving towards diabetes, then you eat a diet that's rich in naturally occurring fats, which means animal fats and fats from actually fruits like avocados and oils. And uh, you, ref you know, avoid eating uh, refined, highly refined processed grains or, you know, foods, as you put it, or food-like substances, as Michael Pollan put it, and eat whole foods instead. And yeah, I would try to communicate this idea that, that the, the, most of us in the U.S., a large proportion of the population, over half are suffering from, especially at, at, over the age of 50, by the time you get to the age where you're at risk of really at risk of chronic disease, it's being driven by this carbohydrate content. So I'm more interested in getting people to understand, to educate people rather than to tell them how to eat, I would like to educate them on what these foods do to them. And then they can conclude on their own how best to eat, you know, with this guidance from the physicians and researchers who have been actually successfully treating obese and diabetic individuals with these diets. I couldn't expect a better answer for you. Educating yeah. people is always the best we can do. Yeah. Thank you so much, Gary. Thank you for all your work. You inspire lots of people and you make it possible for many people to change. And this is really something. Thank you very much for being here today. It has been such a pleasure. And um, I hope to catch up with you one day to make more questions. It was really pleasant to have you here. OK, thank you for having me, Renata. Take OK, care. so have a good day. OK, bye bye. Bye.